for me as perhaps for her to be interviewed by a little known academic. Dr. Rosa Ottenbayeva was born in Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan. She was educated in Moscow. She holds a doctoral degree in philosophy. She was twice named foreign minister in independent Kyrgyzstan, the first time under the Soviet Union. She has also held the post of Kyrgyzstan's ambassador to the United States and to the United Kingdom. And she was eventually appointed first woman president of Kyrgyzstan in 2010 and 2011. In addition, of course, she has had uh, a prominent international role in UN conflict mediation, particularly in Georgia. She has played, of course, a very prominent role in Kyrgyz national politics, but left twice, I might say, disenchanted with former political allies, former presidents Akayev and Bakiev. But she won political recognition as leader of the Tulip Revolution in 2005 against President Akiev and his regime. But I think it was really her role in the political crisis which led to the overthrow of President Bakiev in 2010 and her very skillful handling as interim president at the time of this delicate political transition that followed the crisis, which ensured her place in the pantheon of Kyrgyzstan's most illustrious leaders, and indeed earned her the illustrious and enviable title of Miss Clean for her campaign against corruption in public life. It was also in no small part to her willingness to press for more powers to be transferred to parliament and to step down and gracefully hand over power to her successor, President Atambaev, following presidential elections in December 2011. Today, Dr. Atambaev heads a foundation bearing her name that is dedicated to the social and economic welfare of women and young children in Kyrgyzstan and enjoys the renown that goes with having been named by Newsweek International in 2011 as one of the world's 150 most influential women. So welcome, Dr. Ottenbayeva. Tell us then, have you given up on politics or is there still a role that you can envisage as Kyrgyzstan faces an increasingly uncertain future that some believe could compromise its standing as the only functioning parliamentary democracy in Central Asia. Faisana, it will be a very political session, but... <laughs> Go ahead. I uh, thank you very much, everyone who came uh, today to my session. I do believe that uh, my presentation today will be one of the bridges between Kyrgyzstan and uh, uh, Pakistan, and especially with this uh, wonderful uh, city, Lahore. I enjoyed so much over these uh, three days, uh, this uh, uh, absolutely charming city with such a rich culture. Uh, uh, we don't uh, uh, know that uh, in such a uh, closeness, uh, for example, I don't know how um, long will be flight from Bishkek to Lahore, probably less than to Delhi. Uh, we have a direct flight from Bishkek to Delhi and it is just about three hours. So I do believe that uh, everyone who came to the session, you would learn a bit more about your neighbors and uh, Kyrgyzstan is uh, almost neighboring country. We want to build now roads which will uh, bring us together and uh, Pakistani ports will be one of the closest ports for Kyrgyzstan to get to the sea. Regarding the future uh, um, politics uh, in my country and my role, 
I would say that uh, we just turned our country to the parliamentarism. It's happened, uh, it took place in 2010, and it, it's a new uh, form of governance for us completely after uh, decades and decades of authoritarian and communist regime in uh, my country and uh, other uh, Central Asian countries, they have presidential form of governance. So we thought that uh, 20 and more years, it's just enough to test presidential form of power and it doesn't uh, help to build uh, uh, such a, uh, the, the country based on the equal uh, system, uh, on equality, on uh, democracy, and uh, in 2010, we turned country to parliamentarism. We just recently had parliamentary elections, and uh, elections been uh, quite successful. Six parties, uh, they came to the power. Uh, they uh, built up uh, the government, and uh, this is the second uh, such a um, uh, second parliament uh, in the parliamentary system. We are testing, we are uh, learning about the new system and uh, I do believe that uh, this system is uh, much more efficient if we are talking about the uh, fight against corruption. We are not going to the streets. If something wrong, it comes to the table of parliamentarian and it is a matter of very such a hot discussion and we do think that uh, such a transparency and such a publicity, such a open debates uh, will help us to build more equal society. So Faizan, I would uh, tell you that uh, there is uh, no such a, uh, a hot need uh, to enter to politics. I'm trying to uh, uh, pass the message that uh, uh, to step down from the presidential position it is not a tragedy. You can uh, uh, have a happy life. You can uh, work for the sake of the society. You can do something very useful for your country. And so my foundation does a variety of all sorts of projects uh, in the sake of my uh, nation. So um, uh, this is uh, the region and uh, this is the whole, I would say, the post-Soviet uh, space where Everyone thinks that uh, you should stay on the helm. Uh, you know, fortunately, or what, I just came from Singapore, and of course, uh, I learned a great deal about the consistency of the power. And so one man can change the country uh, forever, probably, this uh, Singapore's uh, wonder, economical, financial wonder for all of us uh, on the globe. This is lesson to be learned but it is uh, not necessary for everyone. Uh, um, uh, uh, moreover, uh, you uh, have uh, more troubles today when uh, someone stays more than necessary. I think there will be many people in this hall agreeing with that, and we are listening very carefully to what you're saying, that you can continue to be politically engaged and yet step down from a position of formal power. But tell me, you're still an exceptional woman in the context of this region, Central Asia. There aren't very many women in politics. And I wonder why not in Kyrgyzstan. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, it's been relatively less vulnerable to uh, Islamist pressures that in turn put pressure on, pressures on women to abstain from public life, relatively fewer pressures than, say, neighboring Uzbekistan or Tajikistan. Do you think, do you think that alone might help move Kyrgyzstan in the direction of allowing more women to enter the public sphere? Uh, Faisan, of course, uh, of Kyrgyzstan, as well as other Central Asian countries, we are the same uh, nature countries as Pakistan, as other our neighbors, in the term that uh, uh, we are the country with the Islamic background and now Islam is on rise in our countries and uh, patriarchal uh, rules are there and uh, I would say that um, a lot of uh, such a tradition which 
put women backward. But uh, do remember that we have also Soviet legacy with secularization and emancipation of women, and it gave us a lot. I'm the uh, product of the Soviet uh, system also in many ways. Uh, I have, uh, uh, I got my education in the Soviet days. Uh, I was propelled up to the uh, member of the board of the Soviet Minister of Foreign Affairs. And I worked for Mr. Shevardnadze in 90s, and uh, I'm very proud to say that uh, during our time, uh, Gorbachev, Shevardnadze's time, uh, the foreign policy of Soviet Union changed dramatically. We drove the uh, Afga uh, Soviet troops from Afghanistan uh, to uh, uh, the Eastern uh, Europe uh, uh, was uh, liberated from the communist system and uh, Germany uh, rejoined. So, I mean, uh, all those achievements been the achievements of uh, Perestroika and Glasnost, certainly. Uh, but in Kyrgyzstan, in post-Soviet Kyrgyzstan, and we are going to celebrate our quarter of century uh, of our independence. Uh, this is uh, the story of uh, uh, achievements, real achievements, at the same time uh, of, um, difficulties also, because uh, a lot of our identities, people bind with the life before the Soviets and uh, women should be sort of on the back uh, side uh, of the uh, political development. But when I came as president of the country, and it was really not long uh, time, and uh, I regret that I was not very active uh, in some way, I put forward candidatures for the chairwomen of the Supreme Court, uh, prosecutor general, uh, president of the National Bank and uh, uh, chairwoman of, uh, auditing, uh, of um, uh, auditing chamber, mm -hmm. we say. So, and uh, of those of, um, uh, posts, uh, those positions, been very, very important for us because those areas been the most polluted, the most corrupt, and uh, those women, they've been not just appointed by my signature, no. They went to the uh, parliament, they passed the testimony of, of the parliament, and so they are still working there. So in other words, on the highest position in my country, still chairwomen of the uh, for, uh, court, Supreme Court is women, prosecutor general, if uh, uh, in other terminology it's uh, minister of justice in other countries, uh, she's women. And uh, um, uh, the president of the uh, auditing chamber, she's also women. And so we have 23% of women in the parliament. Of course, uh, today you would not uh, um, wonder anyone in the parliament. Uh, so many countries, they propelled so many women. But generally, of course, we want to have more uh, activity on the on the, the ground, on the grass uh, level, because uh, you see on the highest level, it's everywhere. Yes. And a, there is a risk of tokenism. You can, you can appoint women uh, at the highest levels, but, but very often that is seen as a form of tokenism because precisely you don't have enough women working at the grassroots level. Exactly. Um, it's very interesting what you say, because somewhere in your statement, I seem to read that Whatever one might say, there was a positive legacy uh, of the Soviet Union, secularization and, of course, the emancipation of women. And yet today, there is some fear that even a quarter of a century after political independence, Kyrgyzstan has not quite broken its, shall we say, bonds of dependence with Russia. Um, I mean, do you think that Kyrgyzstan sort of stands in a position where it is still trying to negotiate um, its status vis-a-vis -vis Russia precisely because of its long links, uh, you know, as part of the Soviet Union? Is, is the real break still to come? Uh, I don't know how uh, the audience is uh, um, uh, familiar with our part of the world. Uh, 
um, we do not believe that it was a real colonization of our countries. Uh, we got so many advantages from the Soviet system, we should confess. We got 99% of uh, literacy, we got a uh, healthcare system, social protection system, uh, infrastructure which we have today, it's a result uh, of the Soviet uh, life. Uh, uh, Soviet system uh, governance in our uh, part of the world. But of course, uh, today uh, we have such an alliance, CIS, uh, uh, this uh, Commonwealth of Independent States, which is a form of our uh, divorce, let's say, yes. civilized yes. divorce. And still we, uh, um, we are together in this uh, alliance. Uh, and I don't believe that uh, we'll uh, get... Uh, uh, far from uh, such an uh, alliance. I mean, my country is a small country, it's six million country. Uh, we want uh, to get uh, more identity, more uh, sort of independence, but uh, independence is such, um, such a heavy stuff also. You should uh, handle this. You should uh, uh, give uh, people also all the economical uh, um, uh, independence means what they need today. So the world is interconnected. They watch every day TV, uh, uh, and especially of, uh, middle developed uh, countries also. And they want and they demand a better life. And uh, I do believe that uh, this new uh, step uh, which my country undertook, we became member of the Euro-Asian Economic yes. Alliance. Is it the right step uh, which have been taken? Right. So, I mean, we have now, we've been six million only market, we, uh, we uh, uh, entered into the market uh, 670 million. And if Pakistani people want to do a business, for example, in my country, they can enter and then they would open 170 million market. Uh, Russia, Kazakhstan, Belarus, so I think, uh, uh, today, it's uh, very difficult to, lead, uh, to live just alone. Absolutely. You should be in all sorts of such uh, alliances uh, to survive and to, uh, to uh, high up your standards also. Our uh, entrance to this uh, economical alliance uh, uh, made uh, a lot of uh, changes and differences to my country. We uh, upgraded our standards uh, in, uh, for... for um, uh, veterinary, for phytosanitary, and so on and so on, because uh, Russia's uh, GDP today per capita is uh, about $15,000. Uh, it's uh, 10 times even more than my, uh, ours. So it's in order to uh, uh, export uh, stuff, uh, goods uh, to Russia, you should really get through very tough, tough controls. Right. Um, well, that was very eloquently put. Now. You know, for those of us following events in the region commonly described as AFPAC, um, we know how important the Manas Air Base was. And in 2014, of course, U.S. troops vacated that base in Kyrgyzstan, which was a key staging post for, for U.S. troops. And there were reports at that time, well, within some sections of the press, that it heralded, as it were, uh, ever-growing closeness to, to Russia, and that Kyrgyzstan found itself, as I said, in a difficult and precarious position between, on the one hand, the demands and the imperatives of, of uh, Western powers, uh, and, and uh, Russia. And I was just wondering whether you want to say something about how difficult it has been to steer a course between these conflicting pressures. I mean, in Pakistan, of course, you know, we've lived with these conflicting pressures for decades. Uh, do you have something to tell us? No, again, no, we are uh, quite a new actor on the world uh, politics and uh, uh, to get equipped for any 
upcoming president to the world actors. It's, it takes time, it takes experience. It's emerging country and uh, uh, being uh, of, uh, in touch now with America, European Union, and uh, west, uh, east. Uh, so it, it, uh, I do believe now, after 25 years, that uh, we should accumulate a lot of uh, experience, knowledge, and expertise. So uh, we don't have uh, so many people and history and tradition of communication with many countries. Uh, that's what we need uh, uh, for the future. Regarding the port, uh, uh, airport, Manas, uh, civil port, and uh, American and Western uh, forces, air, uh, uh, military forces uh, landed there, and uh, planes been uh, fueled there, and uh, going to Afghanistan. That was our uh, part of the mission uh, uh, against uh, terrorism, over, uh, starting from 2011. So, uh, you see, uh, uh, Russia's uh, um, attitude to this was uh, sort of, uh, this is our domain, Kyrgyzstan is our domain. At the same time, Russia also uh, supposed to contribute, and everyone want to gain their peace. Uh, Russia was agreed to open up uh, Ulyanovsk, another port. If uh, uh, Manas is closed, then uh, Ulyanovsk was uh, ready to be open. Yes. So, I mean, look, everyone wants uh, to get their piece of cake. Absolutely. Uh, so Absolutely. Uh, we should be also pragmatic very much. Sure. Uh, sure. We lost uh, $60 million uh, uh, for rent uh, for this uh, support. Yeah. Uh, let's say about $200 million fueling uh, this, uh, those uh, planes, uh, military planes and so on. Mm. Uh, so that was uh, sort of uh, inter-exchange. Uh, now we are a member of this uh, Eurasian Economic Alliance, uh, which means a lot to us. Uh, but uh, look, uh, we should count. Sure, I mean, we should sure. count everything. So everyone wants a piece of cake in the region, and there's one big beast in the region we haven't talked about, China. And of course, you have quite a significant Chinese presence in Kyrgyzstan, a um, large number of Chinese working in your energy and mining sectors. And reading about this, I was reminded of, of Nepal, which is sometimes described as a yam between two stones, China and India. And I was wondering whether you might find that comparison at all useful, helpful in the case of Kyrgyzstan. India is a bit far from us. Uh, no, uh, I meant between. No, no, between no. Just uh, no. I, 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 uh, I got it. Uh, so Pre Prime Minister Modi has visited my country, and we want to develop uh, relations in the future. Regarding China, uh, my country has a thousand kilometer border with China, so which is uh, such a generous uh, length, and uh, we have uh, two controlled passes uh, to Kashgar and. Uh, uh, trade uh, uh, goes very intensively, especially via my country. Uh, uh, trade goes to Russia, to Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan is uh, the largest uh, Central Asian country with 30 million population, but they do not have a border with China. So um, uh, China is interested in uh, a lot of uh, raw materials and uh, uh, trade is intensive. Uh, uh, China is uh, generous uh, now creditor of Kyrgyzstan. We get uh, credits from Exim Bank, uh, from new, uh, I hope, uh, from Asian Infrastructural Bank. Uh, uh, and um, Chinese presence, by the way, not so heavy as uh, you mentioned. Uh, my people are very touched to uh, uh, growing uh, such a number of uh, workers. Although my people can't compete, unfortunately, on the quality and uh, quantity even of these uh, very heavy projects like uh, road construction or uh, uh, construction of the uh, grid lines uh, in very high mountainous altitude. So um, uh, we've been uh, lucky to get uh, some credits. Uh, we are building now uh, uh, railroad, uh, no, uh, uh, highway road, but railroad is on the way. And uh, my country geopolitically is on the way from Europe to China and uh, in this uh, Silk Road uh, uh, project uh, we have there uh, quite a significant place. Uh, 
uh, our attitude is uh, positive. Uh, only China today who give us enthusiasm so, uh, and uh, all these uh, credits and uh, grants uh, coming from China makes us uh, to be uh, on the uh, height of the waves. So your uh, attitude is positive and guarded? Yeah. Because what I'm reading here is that, well, basically, you know, with China, uh, you and many of us don't have much of a choice. We just do what we're told. Okay. Um, one other question, which is perhaps more, which has had a more direct impact, certainly on the course of, of domestic and national politics in, in Kyrgyzstan and its relations with with uh, neighboring Uzbekistan. And, you know, again, there were some very interesting parallels of the kind of situation <clears throat> we have faced here in Pakistan with a very fluid and contested border with Afghanistan and, of course, uh, the unregulated movement of populations between mm -hmm. these two countries. Now, you've had quite severe ethnic tensions mm -hmm. in Kyrgyzstan uh, mm -hmm. involving mainly the Uzbek mm -hmm. population uh, in the southwest. And under Bakiyev, there was talk that the center of power uh, in national politics had shifted from the north in Bishkek down to the south in Osh. And I, I just wonder whether there is now some awareness of that, of, of, of the severity of that problem, and, you know, how the present government, or indeed how you see Kyrgyzstan uh, negotiating this, this, this dilemma. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Faisana, you touched upon a very sensitive uh, such a issue as uh, uh, the um, uh, social fabric of uh, the country and how we handle this uh, when we became independent and uh, uh, c going through transition, through uh, uh, economical hardship, uh, everything uh, became thinner and thinner, right? Uh, and uh, especially during this uh, last conflict, uh, of, um, uh, we had an explosion of uh, such uh, uh, tensions. Uh, so uh, my country is six million population. Out of 6 million, 13 percent are uh, Uzbeks. This is the second largest uh, ethnic group. Uh, we are about uh, 80 ethnic ethnoses uh, living in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, half a million are uh, Slavonic uh, people, Russian and Ukrainian and uh, others. And we have, for example, uh, uh, still 10,000 Germans uh, living in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, uh, they came uh, in uh, the... Um, uh, to Russia, they came uh, in the Tsarin uh, Ekaterina II, and they slowly moved to the um, uh, Siberia and uh, came to the Central Asia. Each of us, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, we have uh, Germans, Koreans, and uh, you know, this is uh, sometimes a uh, uh, new generation. Uh, post-Soviet, uh, uh, independent uh, Kyrgyz people, they do uh, think uh, where these uh, guys came and uh, how uh, it's happened that uh, they came to uh, uh, our countries. Now the point is uh, really to build up new nation, consist from those ethnic groups and uh, to uh, distinctly uh, explain to people contribution of each of these nation. This conflict uh, took place uh, not the first time with, uh, between Uzbeks and Kyrgyz, but the third exactly. time in, uh, uh, um, in, uh, in decades uh, it comes again and again. And this time was uh, very special because uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan, when it got independence, uh, we are going through such a touchy time as uh, a, a stage of privatization of public goods. Everything was uh, public. And uh, now uh, uh, st it started suddenly to be privatized and someone got everything and uh, others, uh, they didn't get uh, so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kyrgyz uh, people, uh, sort of like a title nation, uh, they, uh, they've been on very high position everywhere. So there are uh, a number of uh, such uh, factors uh, which brought to this uh, conflict uh, 
and uh, you are asking how we handled it. It was difficult. We got uh, uh, people died, uh, uh, wounded yes, uh, over very this large conflict. Numbers of casualties. Uh, yeah. uh, but um, uh, we, uh, my country was um, sort of lucky enough. We set, we had a, uh, such a international uh, inquiry commission. Um, consisted from very famous, uh, such uh, internationally known uh, lawyers. And uh, it was uh, unbelievably uh, such a striking fact uh, because uh, in, uh, the, uh, in Russia, in the former Soviet Union, in no country such a commission uh, uh, used to work. And it was first time in my country and we allowed them to come study carefully this conflict and they issued a report which uh, said that it was no uh, criminal, uh, no military uh, criminal there, no genocide and other facts should be proved in uh, uh, decent courts. Mm. So that's the uh, conclusion of this uh, inquiry uh, commission. So, I mean, that was the, uh, um, one of the result of uh, such a, uh, ethnic um, um, conflict and violence in right. my country. I mean, obviously, you've, you, you've laid out very well um, the pressures, the strains uh, of a society very much like ours, a multicultural, multi-ethnic society. How do you actually accommodate uh, these very different uh, groups uh, with, with very different uh, uh, cultures? And um, I was going through the latest report from the International Crisis Group, ICG, um, which actually concerned itself precisely with, you know, the kinds of pressures that are being put on the political system in Kyrgyzstan from um, simmering ethnic tension. And the conclusion broadly of this report was that uh, there is now uh, a risk of, 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 you know, a certain kind of strident nationalism gaining momentum. And one of the examples that they point to, which again, you know, has certainly a resonance for us here in Pakistan, is, of course, this very controversial piece of legislation regarding language, that you now have to be proficient in the Kyrgyz language in order to qualify for government jobs. Now, in this country, in Pakistan, we've had huge problems with the mismanagement of language policy. And I was wondering whether you had any thoughts on that. I mean, certainly there's been opposition from Uzbek opposition I think uh, we must learn from your country so much. No, not on language you problems. Have, uh, not you, not uh, on language you, policy. It's you faced so many such a big and uh, middle and micro challenges which we are going through also. So language, religion, handling with the religion, with uh, other ethnicities. Uh, this is really, this is uh, the internal politics of every country. You are 200 and more million uh, country. We are six million only with our own history. Russian language uh, is uh, official language. We uh, very much we bind with Russia. Russia wants uh, to keep Russian language in our countries, everywhere. Uh, it's very much interested. I don't know regarding Britain if they want to keep uh, English language here or not, and uh, how do they influence uh, in uh, with what means. But in our case, uh, uh, Russian parliament uh, writes sometimes issue uh, that uh, the language is not, uh, uh, it's, it's suffering a bit, and so we do, uh, I, I, I keep telling them, look, uh, if you want uh, to flourish Russian language, then invest, uh, uh, please. Uh, for example, uh, we have a Peace Corps volunteers from the United States, we have a lot of uh, uh, no British Council working, uh, Confucius Institutes, ev everyone invests into the language. So, I mean, nothing is today without uh, such an investment Absolutely. also. So, uh, Russian language is official language, and uh, this is probably the same coin like here, English. Uh, and uh, uh, we understand each other in Central Asia also via Russian language. Uh, for example, Tajiks, they are Farsi-speaking uh, uh, nation. Uh, meanwhile, all uh, other Central Asian countries, we are 
um, Turkic uh, speaking. Uh, we belong to this Turkic group. So um, this is a really serious matter and we are learning. We are uh, trying to get experience from all of the world, uh, how they uh, sort it out. Uh, Pakistani people, I would ask you, how you handle with these scars in school, for example, you know? I mean, this is matter also in uh, the south of my country. It, it comes uh, time to time... You're talking uh, about the hijab, yeah. Yeah, hijab uh, for the uh, school girls, you see? And in the south of my country, they raise this issue. Uh, and uh, it's not uh, in the whole the country, so... And so we are uh, looking even uh, French uh, experience, uh, how, what kind of arguments they use and so on. So, but uh, the matter is uh, we want to empower women. We want to uh, not uh, allow uh, girls who are in hijab leave the school. So you can't change sometimes the situation, but let her uh, uh, go to school. So yes. this is uh, the most important. And uh, uh, I don't know from what side uh, uh, for, to respond to your question. Well, I mean, I, I, I suppose the, the, the equivalent with, with, with Russian as a lingua franca mm. would be uh, comparable to our experience with English as a lingua franca. But we've had huge problems in the early history of Pakistan uh, with the idea of imposing uh, Urdu as the national language against uh, the, the, the language of the majority at that time, the Bengalis. And of course, in the 1970s, that issue resurfaced again as they sought to impose Urdu in parts of the country, and I think here particularly of uh, the southern province of Sindh, where there is a strong current of Sindhi nationalism and where Urdu was deeply resented by native Sindhi speakers who felt that they were being discriminated against uh, in government jobs because they didn't have command over the language. But anyway, that's Pakistan. We haven't managed our language policy very well. And I was wondering, you know, uh, what, what that might have, you know, wh whether you're doing a, a better job of it uh, uh, in, in Kyrgyzstan. But let me just move on to uh, uh, another issue which, uh, again, has a bearing on something we are all familiar with in this country uh, and uh, an issue that you yourself have been personally engaged with and that of course is the issue of corruption and cronyism uh, and of course uh, we know that you know the two former presidents of Kyrgyzstan um, uh, Bakiyev and Bakiyev were both overthrown um, uh, as a result of widespread allegations of, uh, of, of, of corruption. Britain, of course, was, was involved in, in a very controversial matter about Mr. Bakiyev's son. Uh, you know, families who amassed huge wealth uh, and concentrated uh, this wealth in the hands of a handful of, of uh, family members. Sounds familiar, I'm sure. So tell me, how, you know, what do you think is the way forward? Uh, I mean, is this, is this chronic? Is this endemic to this region? Are we destined to live with this kind of, 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 of you know, um, crony capitalism, as some would call it? Or, you know, is there still a way out of it? I mean, you've been very deeply engaged in this issue. I think uh, our societies are uh, much sort of simpler and... Um more easy handling in some way uh, because uh, only 25 years of independence and uh, uh, all of us democrats in my country we've been not agree that presidents violate the constitution they want to stay more than constitution allows them so uh, president akhaev the first our president he was elected at least three times, and uh, uh, the third time, uh, not uh, twice he was elected. When he uh, was going to go to the third time, so uh, people uh, revolted. They uh, come to the central square and they said, uh, no, he put to the parliament to his kids as members of the parliament. And people been upset completely, so. Uh, the, uh, you see, in, in our uh, 
tradition in the post-Soviet, uh, and, and Communist Party didn't allow anything like that, absolutely. And so you know, we, we don't have this past, we don't have this tradition. And uh, when we, uh, uh, like uh, Tabula Rasa, started our history, constitution, which gives only two terms, and persons started uh, to violate and said that I'm irreplaceable. I'm the sort of uh, given to you, to the nation, up to end of your day. Look, uh, nobody wants to tolerate uh, such a situation. And uh, Akhaev, uh, with his uh, two kids elected as uh, parliament, and with his desire to be uh, elected third time for the uh, president, he just left the country. And uh, he still, he lives in Moscow. Yeah. And he thinks that uh, uh, he's um, uh, sort of uh, a kind, nice uh, person who didn't uh, um, s uh, split a um, uh, drop of uh, uh, blood in our country, so uh, who didn't spill the drop of uh, blood in, our, uh, in, in Kyrgyzstan. Although he was accused in corruption, serious corruption, with our gold mining, we have in mm. Kyrgyzstan the largest gold, uh, uh, one of the largest uh, gold uh, deposit, uh, 500 tons of gold. And uh, it was, uh, from the beginning, it was concluded uh, not the right way. So I'm wondering sometimes, look, uh, he's, uh, he teaches there in Moscow <coughs> State University, at, as he says, uh, it's uh, those uh, big countries, why they do allow to corruptionists uh, to, uh, to, to live on, uh, uh, on, on those capitals which they have stolen from the country. So I do remember Marcos fled the country. Of of, um, it was uh, such a publicity throughout the world. But uh, I'm sure that Marcos uh, was no, uh, not given the university uh, uh, cathedra to teach uh, uh, students, students somewhere. So this is really something striking uh, for us. Uh, we, uh, we didn't allow t to the second president uh, to kill journalists, to kill uh, his uh, uh, chief of staff, uh, uh, to, uh, um, to, to pr uh, sort of to privatize the country in five years. So that was the reason of the second revolt. And uh, this, uh, uh, the second uh, president, uh, he started to kill people uh, who came uh, to the uh, square. So, and uh, he was uh, under pressure to leave the country. So that was the case, the second case. I mean, what is about the uh, struggle against corruption? We have now uh, uh, sort of um, shrams on the face. Uh, well, this is in the heart of our people. Yes. They don't like any corruption uh, which will take place in our country. We put uh, this parliamentary system. We do believe that it will work. We should go on this way, keep going, it's difficult. You'll not get immediately success and uh, stable such a development. But parliament started to learn in peace, uh, sort of uh, not in uh, such in fight, uh, mm -hmm. um, how to adopt, accommodate uh, the needs of the people. Yes. So this is the... Well, the fact okay. that you have a relatively strong parliament, uh, that you have uh, a tradition, it seems to me, at least uh, in recent years, of being able to mount and stage uh, mass movements uh, against corruption, which has led to the overthrow of dictators, uh, is actually a sobering thought. I mean, do you think that this, you know, acts as a, as a, as a, as a means of preempting what we have seen uh, in other regions, such as the Middle East, which has, of course, uh, had an Arab Spring with, uh, you know, unintended consequences uh, about which we will not speak this afternoon, uh, some of them certainly uh, very bloody. But uh, what, what you say is quite instructive. The point is to, to be vigilant at all time, but also to have the space to be able to come out on the streets and protest, to be able to organize those movements of civil re resistance against the concentration of dictatorial powers and, 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 uh, and corruption, so that you avoid 
something uh, uh, like the Arab Spring, which can bring in its wake, as I said, uh, quite uh, uh, grave consequences for a region. Uh, I mean, is there something to right. that? Uh, Faisal, if you remember, uh, uh, so our uh, um, uh, revolution uh, uh, took place uh, April 7, 2010. Yeah. It was in the same flow as all this Arab Spring uh, uh, after uh, exactly. Tunisia came and then right. Libya and so on. Uh, and so my country was also very widely shown in Al Jazeera, in uh, CNN and so on. Uh, I do believe that in Pakistan also you have seen a lot of news uh, from my country. Uh, but uh, we've been uh, uh, quite successful to manage uh, this You've crisis. Contained it. Yeah, yeah, to contain this. And uh, uh, when we uh, uh, Bakif left uh, the, uh, the country, and uh, um, suddenly uh, all the powers collapsed. Parliament uh, uh, fled away. Uh, president uh, left the country, and uh, government. Uh, the prime minister. Uh, uh, wrote a letter of resignation and uh, handed me over. So that was the situation on April 7. So and uh, uh, all the parties, opposition parties, we've been together and uh, they uh, asked me to lead, uh, to lead the government, interim government. So, and I think it was uh, of the situation when we're supposed to go through immediately and take the decisions, mm -hmm. right decisions mm -hmm. there. So, and uh, in uh, um, one and a half years, I have conducted uh, first constitution. We wrote the new constitution, which brought a parliamentary system uh, uh, to life. And this uh, was taken to the referendum and uh, in this constitution of, uh, and uh, the rules of adoption of this constitution, it was written that I uh, supposed to be president in this interim time. Yes. So how I came to the power. And in this one and a half years, uh, then I have conducted parliamentary elections. Uh, we built the parliament. And uh, the third, I have conducted presidential elections. Uh, and a uh, new, uh, new president was elected. And then I hand over him power. So, I mean, we managed to do this in one and a half years. Yeah. Although the country was in such yeah. a risky uh, that, momentum. That is an extraordinary story. Because, of course, it happened, as you rightly pointed out, uh, you know, coincided with, with the upheaval in the Middle East. And, of course, one, one reason for, uh, you know, uh, well, one would say the collapse of the, uh, the, the Arab Spring, uh, is possibly that, you know, it's very easy to overthrow uh, dictatorships. But then to begin that process, well, fill the political vacuum first created by exactly. that, and then to begin to, 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 to create new institutions, new functioning institutions, is an altogether more daunting challenge, which clearly you have been able, in some sense, to overcome. Now I'm going to, there are just a few minutes left, but I'm going to just ask you one last question. What do you miss about politics? And if they were to ask you to come back and lead the country, what would you say? No, I'm happy in my situation. Uh, uh, not to have so much responsibility is uh, better, of course, than uh, when you, are, uh, you, you face uh, so much responsibility. But uh, what I miss, uh, I do believe that uh, each country might do much more than it uh, does uh, to find the language of the nation, to find this uh, right way, uh, to be progressive. Uh, to conduct uh, just policy. And you can do this. You can. It's just a matter of uh, your internal maturity and justice and equality, which should be ingredient in you. So, and uh, I, uh, I do believe that my country has a, a bright future and uh, if we'll keep going and uh, sustain this uh, 
very difficult path of uh, parliamentarism because you should listen everyone. You should bring them to compromise. It's not just, I said and you should execute and you should implement. So I think uh, this is uh, really uh, right stuff. There are just a few, quest a few minutes for a couple of questions. Yeah. We've got five minutes for questions, uh, but really keep them short. The gentleman in front. Uh, doctor, my question is that uh, what main difference the people of Kyrgyzstan feel between Kyrgyzstan before disintegration of USSR and Kyrgyzstan after disintegration of USSR? Thank you. What, what, uh, what, uh, what, what, what is the feeling? All right, all right. Amongst uh, this is a very interesting question, which I'm interested uh, very much uh, um, uh, dealing with other countries. Uh, there are a lot of still nostalgia on the, for, on the Soviet Union, because uh, people do think that everything was ready there, everything was available. Social life, uh, for the, uh, it was much better than today, and so on. But uh, uh, the whole generation uh, came up new. And these people, did, they do not know what was the Soviet Union, what kind of entity was. And so we should live with this new reality. And these people, want, uh, they do believe that there is a Kyrgyz state, and uh, it should uh, develop this way or other way, and so they want uh, to develop uh, relations with other countries. They travel throughout the world. They don't know that it was no permission to go to, uh, to other countries uh, in the past, uh, and everything was under control, and so on. So we have a, quite a gap between uh, uh, the past and future, and my generation we are trying to fill this gap, uh, to tell them that, uh, yes, it was uh, the past life, uh, but uh, the future, we should build ourselves, the future which we want. Uh, so, I mean, um, uh, Soviet Union, uh, um, uh, I would say even uh, leaders of uh, the, today's countries, they missed uh, this uh, country. They do believe that uh, to be superpower, it is convenient. and. Uh, to be part of the superpower, also it's very nice to be, because you feel yourself as uh, uh, such a mentor of the world, mm. uh, but uh, to be a small little country, uh, it is uh, difficult, uh, of course, uh, but uh, new generation, those uh, people, they uh, define the future of the country. Perhaps we have to, I'll just take a question from this side, mm -hmm. the gentleman in front. Uh, Madam President, it is extremely encouraging to know that the matters are being resolved in your parliament instead of streets. My question is, are all the problems solved in parliament or there are any exceptions? Uh, this is a good question, uh, a question of... Uh, um, uh, uh, how to say, uh, uh, each branch of power has own responsibility. And uh, uh, transferring to the parliamentary system, still we are learning this uh, art of, uh, uh, um, of the powers that uh, uh, president should not overlap and not should dictate uh, uh, and not to have a pocket parliament and uh, to have their uh, power to dictate uh, uh, whatever decision he wants. So that's uh, the art which we are learning now. And uh, uh, President was uh, one of the leaders of our revolution and uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he, uh, he does his best uh, to, be, to limit his power. So, I mean, a uh, tricky question which uh, you pose, I, I got it. I got it. Yeah. I guess there right, is there's a gentleman on this side. Thank you. Just wait for the mic. Thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, the concept of the rule by the proletariat, as it was expounded by the uh, Lenin and Marxism, Sorry. could only survive for a period of 70 years. My question is, whether it was a philosophical distortion or it was a managerial lack of managerial leadership 
that could not avail the opportunity to the proletariat society. Was it, was it, yes, it's, did the Soviet Empire collapse because it was flawed in its thinking or it didn't have the managerial and political skills to hold it I think together. it's a, a question about the volume of response, right? It's a, quite a big question. Uh, Soviet Union's uh, collapse uh, is uh, uh, the whole uh, academy, but uh, um, it was uh, because uh, Soviet Union lost uh, this competition uh, to the uh, market economy, to democracy, and it, uh, it, it uh, uh, became very uh, um, uh, weak from inside, uh, and a lot of uh, problems, uh, tensions, and uh, uh, thresholds within the uh, country we had already and of course this pressure and tension to the Western system uh, it was clear so that was uh, the result from internal and external factors that's how I would uh, respond do we have time for one more question all right just one more question on this side thank you Thank you, President, for sharing much information about your country. Uh, my question is that, how do you see your, uh, the future of your country after the implementation of China's Silk Road project? Uh, right, because uh, this ro uh, we are on the way from uh, uh, east to west, and uh, uh, if this road, uh, especially uh, uh, your road, uh, will be implemented, then will be exactly on the way of, uh, which will start from Kazakhstan and then will go via Kyrgyzstan and cross uh, Kyrgyz Chinese border in Torogard and came via, via Kashgar, it will go to Karakoram Shosse and uh, um, via China to come to Pakistan and uh, reach your port in Pakistan. It will be shortest way, about 2,000 kilometers from my country to the sea. We don't have shortest access to the sea. This is really something what we should, uh, uh, sh should make known for every Kyrgyzstani and uh, uh, do our best to implement uh, this uh, project. Uh, because uh, uh, when you have a roads, when you have uh, infrastructure, then uh, this uh, connection between people, trade, uh, everything will uh, uh, go, uh, will be uh, turned uh, in. Uh, would you imagine this uh, caravansarais, how slowly they've been in the past? And uh, today I was uh, now in uh, a fort, in your fort, and uh, I um, admired the work of pigeons which uh, flew everywhere. Today you have internet and uh, Thanks God I have a communication with my friends in Pakistan uh, so quick. Uh, if we'll have a highway, one day railway on this road, then I think uh, Pakistan and Kyrgyzstan will be much, much closer than today. Today, uh, all of us, we still go to uh, uh, London or uh, Kyrgyz go to Moscow, but why not uh, to uh, revive this road be, uh, between us, between Pakistan and Kyrgyzstan. This is the point. Yes, why not? Well, on that optimistic projection of the future, it gives me very, very great pleasure once again to thank Raza Ottenbayeva. It's been wonderful talking to you, and I'm sure all of you have enjoyed it. Thank you for being here, and welcome to Pakistan. Do not approach the speakers on...